When I started off as a vascular surgeon, I very quickly realized that arterial surgery was not particularly interesting to me because although it's very heroic, it's fairly simple, blood just goes one way. And I quickly became interested in the science of veins. And the last 15, 16 years has been the most fantastic time in veins because we've gone from what we thought we knew and absolutely everything as I was taught to medical students and registrar is completely wrong and has been changed. And now it's, comp it's been the most exciting thing. And I hope by the end of this evening I've imparted some of the enthusiasm to you for the right reasons. Um, because it really has become the most fascinating subject. And it's not just leg varicose veins now, it's the whole of the study of phlebology, which means all of the veins basically from the diaphragm downwards at the moment. We don't do too much above that, although that is coming into arms and also those of you who are interested in multiple sclerosis. So the whole venous system is becoming phenomenally interesting as long as you approach it for a research base. Now, there's a couple of things I want to just say before I launch into it. Firstly, can you all hear me? So that's all right, because I need to know I'm speaking up enough. Secondly, also, when I get excited, and veins are very exciting, and when I get excited and start talking, I tend to get faster and faster. So if I start getting too fast, I'm quite happy for anyone to do that, okay? and I promise I'll slow down, because some of the uh, bits I come out with, I do get tend to uh, gabble a bit. So the biggest thing that happened with veins when I was going through, I, I, used to, I was in Oxford as an academic, as a senior registrar, but with the university. I noticed that we spent all our times in the arterial side, looking at people who'd had three aneurysms, infected grafts, all the different bits, all in their 90s, and they're all are going to be dead in six months whether we operated on them or not. And outside, there's a whole group of 20, 30, 40, 50 year old people who had a long life ahead of them, all who had varicose veins, venous disease, and would be treated by an SHO and a, in, and a nurse, all be told they needed stripping or nothing at all, just some stockings and all of them having the wrong treatment, and because of that, having a terrible quality of life for the next 30, 40, 50 years. I, I really thought to myself that we were really concentrating on completely the wrong area if we wanted to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And so that's one of the reasons I decided that being a surgeon was more interesting. And so right from the 80s, I started looking at how can we reduce recurrence? Because the big thing that I was always taught about is that varicose veins always come back, and that is absolutely wrong. They only come back because we didn't understand how to treat them properly. And nowadays, we shouldn't get that problem at all. We also used to tell people things like, don't, don't get your veins done until you've had your babies. Why? Because purely simply, we knew that we couldn't do them very well, so we used to try and get rid of the patients. Now, we know that if you treat the patients before they have their families, you, you prevent them getting thrombophobitis and all the horrible things they have during pregnancy. So in fact, now the answer is, as soon as you know you have venous disease, treat it. Stop getting the problems, and then you don't get the complications later on. So this is why I've, I've written a book at the moment. It's um, I've uh, uh, unfortunately not quite finished it with the publishers, so it's not available tonight. But anyone who wants to be sent a copy of it, it should have been available for you tonight, but anyone who wants a copy, if you leave your name and address with Nicola, and I'll have it sent to you. And it's going to be called something along the lines of why varicose veins come back and how to stop them. So why do varicose veins come back? There's only there's three reasons why varicose veins come back. And that is that you've treated the wrong vein, number one, which you'd think was wrong, but I'll explain why. Secondly, you've treated the right vein, but the wrong technique. And thirdly, de novo reflux. In other words, if you go out today onto Oxford Street and you bring 100 people in here who have varicose veins somewhere in their family, and we all scan them, we look at them, and none of them have varicose veins, then we bring them back in one year's time, between 3 and 4.5% will have varicose veins by next year. And that's the natural deterioration of the venous system. That tells you something. That means that anyone can get down to a recurrence rate between 3 and 4.5. We audit ours every year, and we've got 3.3% recurrence, and it's always been over. It always means that if anyone ever tells you that recurrence rate is less than 3% per year, they're lying or they don't check. And there's a paper in the British Journal of Surgery that says the recurrence rate from varicose veins is 1% in 10 years. That is erroneous. That's impossible unless you amputate the legs or kill the patients. So we know that that's wrong. So we have to know what the natural deterioration of the disease is, and that's the baseline. You can't get lower than that. So who am I? I'm Mark Whiteley. I'm a visiting professor at the University of Surrey where we set up a very big vein unit where we're doing a lot of very innovative work on immunocytochemistry and cellular biology of veins, which I'll come to in a bit. Um, I've got 90 peer-reviewed publications at the moment. I was the first person in the UK to do the new end of Venus techniques in March 1999, which has started this whole revolution, because it was only when we learned how to do veins properly, we realised the science that we should have known before we did that. 
I've got one book out at the moment and a couple more coming, and we run the International EVLT Training Academy, and I run, obviously, the Whiteley Clinic, which is sponsoring tonight. I also run a thing called the Leg Ulcer Charity, and if those of you, if any of you know anybody with leg ulcers, please look at the charity, because every charity at the moment in leg ulcers keeps saying to people, this is how you dress it, this is the nutrition, everything, and everyone forgets that you can cure 85% of leg ulcers if you just do a scan and treat the underlying veins. And that's nice guidelines and everything, but the district nurses just keep on dressing, 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 and nobody gets a chance to be cured. And so we set up this charity just to get that one message home. I also run an international thing called the College of Phlebology, where we're trying to stop vascular surgeons who do 90% arteries from playing with veins. We want people who do veins properly to do as nice says, work in groups, work with people who image veins properly, and do the job so you get good results. And that's actually, as I say, what nice guidelines are at the moment. So what's interesting about veins? The first most interesting thing about veins is, is blood doesn't run uphill. And so you have to go by gravity. And when I was at medical school, they just said, oh, that's fine, it gets pumped up. But when you actually start looking at how that works, it actually becomes quite difficult to understand. Because you've got this thing, you've got the height of the blood, you've got the column from the heart to the foot, and that is HROG, which is the height times the gravity times the density of blood. And it doesn't matter if you're fat or thin, or if you're pregnant or not, or whether you've got pressure on your veins. That doesn't matter. None of that matters. All that matters is your height. Nothing else does it. If you're pregnant or you've got pressure on your veins, that might cause a DVT by crushing the veins, but none of that gives pressure downwards. Constipation on this, it doesn't cause a wave of pressure to the ground. All these things we're taught about at medical school is incorrect. So what we have to know is that the heart is where we measure all the gravity from. So if you're in aesthetics and you're doing veins above that, that's absolutely fine. You can use lasers, you can use what you like, because that is not a gravity problem. Once you're below the heart, you use lasers on the veins on the surface at your peril, because they're almost all due to gravity. And you've got to be really careful with leg veins. So tinangiectasia broken in the codependries, 88% of adult females get them. 79% of adult males, and because it's a huge market, you just see everybody offering thread vein treatments, and that's probably wrong because they're not checking for the underlying cause, and so therefore patients aren't going to get a very good result. Varicose veins, 15 to 20% of adults have varicose veins, and of course, as we all know, the problem with medicine is we all come from learning history, and varicose veins is what we see. When you actually check with ultrasound, for every person with varicose veins that you see, there's another one with venous reflux that you can't see. And these poor patients are the ones who get venous eczema, leg ulcers, they see their doctors, they see their nurses, and they look at them and say, oh, you don't have varicose veins. They do, you just don't see them on the surface. So actually what we're looking at, which is superficial venous reflux disease, is 30 to 40% of adults. And since 2009, I've been popularizing in every article I write, I call these hidden varicose veins, because people then understand it, both medical and non-medical. So in my books and everything, it's hidden varicose veins. And if you've heard that phrase before, I'm really pleased, because we have been pushing it quite hard. So this idea of hidden varicose veins, people, you can always say, yes, you have varicose veins. You can never say, no, you don't, unless you have a duplex scan. Terribly important point. So what have we measured? We measured in what's called the CAP classification, which looks complex. It's very, very easy. Normal, C0. C1 is telangiectasia or thread veins. C2 is varicose veins. You split that into symptomatic or asymptomatic. C3 means that the venous reflux has caused swelling. C4 means it's caused skin damage. C5 and 6 is a healed ulcer and active ulcer. And that's a continuum, although it doesn't always go in stepwise. That should tell you instantly that varicose veins are not cosmetic in a great many people, because otherwise you wouldn't have C3 and more. So let's, thread veins can look very nice and simple. C2A, just varicose veins, which are asymptomatic or symptomatic, which is C2S. C3 is the edema when you start to see a bit of extra swelling, or you, the classic thing is seeing the, imprintation of, uh, the imprinting of a sock top. C4, these are very common. So a bit of eczema here, a bit of lipodermatosclerosis, a bit of brown staining. That is always, people just call it phlebitis. It's not. Phlebitis means you've got a clot in the vein. These skin changes around are due to venous hypertension. So saying that doesn't exist because it's how tall you are. There's no such thing as venous hypertension. But what it means is the changes of venous reflux. And that's it. And all of those, as soon as you see those, whether it's varicose veins or not, instantly need a duplex ultrasound scan because they're heading for ulcers if they don't. And stockings don't treat it, creams don't treat it, only blocking the reflux will treat that. 
This is a healed ulcer, it used to be a leg ulcer there, and they've had endovenous surgery, it's healed nicely, and this is actually the leg before we healed it down there, which as you can see, the actual leg ulcer is only about this big. The rest of it is thanks to the dressings that become sodden. So when you see it, the one like that, put the patient into bed for a while, elevate legs, give some heparin, watch what happens if it's venous. You end up with a real ulcer, which is small. Do a scan, treat the veins underneath it, they go home, and 50% of them, according to our research we published in 2012, don't even need a stocking afterwards. They're completely cured for life and back to normal life. This is an ulcer which is much easier because we can see the varicose veins above it, so that one's a bit of a giveaway. Why is this important? There's, a, there's several things why this isn't the greatest system in the world. That's because if you've got hidden varicose veins, you go from C0 and you might go straight to C6 and get a leg ulcer, so the first thing you see, or C3. So there's a lot of criticism with this, but it's the best we've got. Am I a nutter? Yes, I am. But apart from that, for the first time, I've been preaching this sort of stuff since 1999. But for last, nice now agree with almost everything that I've been writing in newspapers and things since 1999. And since two th July 2013, almost everything we've said in the Whiteley Clinic is now part of the NICE guidelines. And people don't uh, really look at varicose veins much. But some of the things that are interesting, although, although the NICE guidelines don't actually use CEAP classification, they use the words of the CAP classification. Basically, if you've got thread veins or asymptomatic varicose veins, that's cosmetic. People won't touch it. No insurance will. NHS won't touch it. Nobody should touch it. But you can help those people if they want it. But it is an aesthetic problem. If they're C2S onwards, they have venous disease. And research after research after research, including the reactive study, shows that once you've got varicose veins and symptoms, you should have surgery. Because randomized controlled studies, the reactive study, have shown that if you don't have treatment, you get more complications and worse quality of life than if you have treatment, even with the complications of surgery. And then that's with the old surgery, they have to even the new things that have fewer. So this is by NICE guidelines, all of these patients should be treated. Now, of course, the people who run NICE didn't check with the government that they could afford it, first of all, and with 40% of the population having these problems, of course, that's a difficulty. So that we have a difference now between the quality standards, which say this should be funded, versus what patients actually need so, and what, what the government can afford. But when we, I, I don't get caught in the politics if I can ever help it. All I can say is that it's randomised controlled evidence now shown that C2S, in other words, varicose with any symptoms and worse, should be treated. And according to NICE, they should be treated. They need a full consultation. It is not good enough to do a quick tick list because there are other problems you can have with the venous disease. You should have a full assessment by a vascular service, which is not a doctor sitting down doing their own quick scan, and we'll come on to that in a minute. It is a proper vascular service where a vascular technologist who does nothing but veins all day long gets the right diagnosis and gets a full thing. And you have to work in a team. If you don't have a team, you're breaking NICE guidelines. We now know that endothermal ablation, which is endovenous laser, radiofrequency, and some of the new endothermals have been shown to be the way to cure veins permanently. And we've just won the National Prize for Vein Surgery my clinic for the second year in a row, and we've just been selected as the top um, vein paper in the UK to be presented next month at the AVF by actually showing how that works. And what actually happens is you don't burn the vein and contract it, I must think. You actually upregulate a gene called P53, which causes apoptosis, and the vein undergoes apoptosis. In fact, the vein wall commits suicide, and that's why it never comes back. So this idea of you cause thrombosis, you blow it's all rubbish. What actually happens is if you get the right technique at the right level, you get apoptotic reaction, the vein will disappear, and it will never come back again. And that's, we've, as I say, we've now proven that it's a career for publication. So once you've got endothermal ablation, the next thing is ultrasound foam sclerotherapy. I will show you some data in a minute that we have just published, and today has just been accepted by the European Journal of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery, why foam sclerotherapy works for small veins, but it does not work for big veins. So our colleagues who are injecting these into truncal veins do not get good results, and there's a very simple reason why. Thirdly, stripping should never be done. According to NICE, if you've got no other options, you can do it, but I'll show you why it should never be done. But at the moment, that's what NICE says. Number one, laser or radio frequency if you can do it. Number two, foam if you can't, or if the vein doesn't take it. And number three, stripping only if you can't do the other two. And in 22,000 patients we've had, we have never had a patient who can't be treated with those and need stripping. It doesn't happen. We've even closed an eight centimetre sophenofemoral junction with laser. There's no such thing as a vein too big for laser if you know the techniques. So stockings are not a treatment. We've said it for many, many years. They are, they help. They can 
hold people in abeyance, they can be used postoperatively, they are not a treatment. And now even NICE has said, yep, yeah, look at the evidence, stockings are not a treatment, because as soon as you take them off, all the goodness goes. Leg ulcers, if their leg ulcer is there for two weeks or more, it must be referred for a venous opinion, because if you have a scan, you can cure them in 85% of cases. That's nice guidelines. How many people get referred? No one, hence the charity. So, uh, the vascular service is all important now. Venous color flow jubilee ultrasound was started in 1985. It's what got me into veins because we can now see what's happening inside in real time. And it's just the most amazing thing as long as it's used the right way. But like any car, if you don't drive it properly, you don't get good results. And I'll come to this, uh, I'll come to this in a minute now because when we have asymptomatic varicose veins, we have to remember that almost all of them in fact, 100% of asymptomatic varicose veins still have venous reflux disease, and only venous duplex will show you that. Telangiectasia, so thread veins on the legs, 89% have underlying varicose veins that need foam sclerotherapy as a minimum, and 40% are associated with truncal reflux, and 15% are associated with incompetent perforators. Now, this is out there. This was published in 2001. It won't be long before the first couple of people with telangiectic matting and brand staining will sue because they didn't have a scan first because it's in the public domain. This is all proven and all the references are down here. If you need the references, I can give you them later. This is all published data. So why is it that a scan isn't good in a doctor's hand, no matter how well-meaning they are? It's because when we went to medical school, there were only two veins we had to worry about. This thing that used to be called the long saphenous vein, and in 2001 was renamed the great saphenous vein, and the small saphenous vein, which is the, uh, used to be called the short saphenous vein, Anyone who calls them long and short is missed the boat because 2001 it was changed internationally. And the reason was LSV can be long saphenous vein or it can be lesser saphenous vein. And people were getting confused. So there's a, there was the, the European UIP meeting in Rome in 2001. And you sat down and we got the new names for all veins. And that was then reiterated and the Americans came on board in 2004. So since 2004 we've had standard names for all of the veins. This is just an example here. This patient came to me, said she had no um, symptoms, obviously C2A, there's no swelling, nothing worse. But what she'd actually had is somebody had very kindly ablated her great venous vein, but that wasn't the problem. The anti-excessive venous vein was incompetent, as were the perforators. However, when you go to your usual, when you look up on the internet and they say, we'll do your nice, um, you would do, you know, for X amount, we're the cheapest around, we'll ablate your veins, that's exactly what you get. You get your great saphenous vein ablated. You don't get the source of the problems. So this is what we're saying. The first thing, the wrong vein was treated. It might have been that that needed treatment as well. We don't know. But this was only six months before. Definitely, they didn't treat the actual cause of the reflux, although it might have been 50% of it. Again, we don't know because we've got to look back in history. But this is what happens when someone just does a quick scan themselves. Oh, great saphenous vein is incompetent. We'll treat it. If you don't look for the perforators, and you don't look for the anterior accessory saphenous vein, you're not going to get the sources of reflux and the patient's going to get their, their paid veins back again. So that's the first thing, treating the wrong vein, not going to get a good result. Another patient here, varicose veins here, varicose veins here. One of our vascular techs made a mark, it's a varicose veins down there, patient unhappy again. Again, a nice ablation, somebody's done an ablation, they've gone along to the local clinic, had it done. Why hasn't it worked? It hasn't worked because there's a perforate of reflux. Now, most people still don't believe in perforator vein reflux. The reason they don't believe in it is they can't treat it, because the old way of treating it was a big slash. Then in 1986, a man called Hauer invented a way of doing it with kid pin hole, uh, keyhole surgery, where you put this great big telescope in the leg, and you saw the area, but it's very painful general anaesthetic. Judy Holstock and I invented trollop technique in 2001, and it's now done local anaesthetic with a single needle hole. And perforate is now not a worry. Because they're not a worry, that's how we get our recurrence rates way down, because they're easy to treat now. So, who which veins need treatment? As we know, great saphenous vein and small saphenous vein, because that's what we scan. However, as you've just seen in that patient, anterior accessory saphenous vein, that's a third of patients with varicose veins need that vein treated as well. But if you do a limited scan, you don't check it. A bifid great saphenous vein. It's very common that if you do a quick scan, you see a normal great saphenous vein, but 10% of people have a bifid one, and the second one might be incompetent. You would have missed it if you just do your unlimited scan. And if you don't note a bifid vein, even if you're doing uh, the end of his laser, never mind a stripping, you're not going to get the right vein in any case, because you need to know you've got to treat two. A bifid small saphenous vein, about 5% of cases, not so common. 
a Giacomini vein, where the small saphenous vein doesn't go in at the junction, but goes right round the back and comes up into the groin. That's a, not an uncommon variant to have. Unfortunately, it is actually found in primates. And I did have a vascular technologist who used to tell my lady patients that they had monkey legs in his sort of a, the thing, which is terrible for my branches, you can imagine, because that's not what you really want to tell people. But if the Jacqueline, it is actually the simian way of having the vein thing. They don't have a small sphenous vein, it goes up and round. But I do suggest you don't tell his monkey legs. It's, a, it's just sort of a, a, a different way. We have the lonely incompetent perforators, which are very important. This is the way to understand these, is if you have a... Uh, like a, a squeezy bottle that's full of water and your hands around it are like the calf muscle and you squeeze, you have to get that blood or the water a metre and a half to the heart. If you now drill a hole between your fingers and you squeeze, you can imagine the pressure coming in. That's how perforators cause a problem. Thomas Sears used to write stuff in the 60s and a lot of people used to write stuff in the 60s and 70s and say perforators aren't important. And the reason was the techniques they were looking at where you squeeze the leg and then you look for the reflux. And perforators reflux in the active phase of muscles, not the passive. And because of that, nobody's ever understood small saphenous veins and incompetent perforators, which act in the active phase. And the problem is, we have lots of people who believe small saphenous veins cause problems, because they obviously do, but don't believe perforators. Now, if you can't, the mechanism's identical for both. You can't believe in one without the other. So this is a little argument we tend to have in vein circles. You can imagine they're quite boring meetings at times, but I get excited by them. We also have incompetent perforators above the knee, and there's a very common one on the outside of the thigh. It comes through the muscles straight down, and it causes veins on the outside of the thigh. Very often in the thread veins. Again, if you don't treat that with trollop first, foam sclerotherapy in the underlying vein, and then the thread veins, you don't get on top of it. So it's an abnormal thing. So, as I've already told you, perforated vein reflex used to be this great big operation where like Cockett and Linton used to do these huge incisions and very, very unpopular. Howard in 1983 produced sets and then reproduced it in English in 1985 and 1986. And then in 2000 we invented this thing called Trollope, which is very nice and easy, and it literally is this. It's ultrasound guided, needle straight into the vein, laser radio frequency into it, low colour acidic around it, and Bob's your uncle, you close it. We've published five-year results on this. We've published one-year results on this. You can do it with laser radio frequency. It is not difficult to do, provided you can hit a one-and-a-half-millimeter vein three centimeters over the ground, under the skin. And, of course, that means that you need to be doing it every day. If, you're not, if your ultrasonographers are not doing the scans every day and you're not doing them every day, you just don't get into these veins. So this is why we need phlebologists as a separate speciality if we're going to get veins right. Um, pelvic vein reflux has become the really big thing at the moment because for some reason, and I can see why, because I'm, I'm originally a vascular surgeon, we used to like to think that veins stop to the groin. And we used to like to think that because we don't have to worry if they stop at the groin, but of course they don't. If you're a blood cell and you're in the toe and you go up, you can reflux out of a perforator of the ankle, you can reflux out of a small saphenous vein, you can reflux out of a great saphenous vein, you can reflux out of an internal iliac vein, and you can reflux out of an ovarian or pelvic vein. If that didn't happen, boys wouldn't get varicose seals and we wouldn't have to cough when we were 11 years old in front of the school doctor. So the whole point with this, we know that venous reflux disease involves pelvic veins, and we all know that because when we were in medical school, we learned about varicose seals in boys. But if you're a woman and you put your testicles inside you and call them ovaries, we suddenly ignore that they've got a problem. So all these boys have their testicle, testicular veins treated, women have pelvic congestion syndrome, vulval varicosities, all the other bits and pieces, and we just ignore them because we can't see them. And this has been a real big thing with us for the last 16 years, because we started noticing that all these patients were coming to see us, and they'd had the great and the good, all the wonderful surgeons that we all know, who have been stripping their veins for years and stuff, and they kept on having these veins streaming down the inside of their legs. And they kept going back into the groin and rescanning and stuff, they didn't get to the result of it because it's not a leg vein. So this is a typical lady. She came to see me. and She's got big varicose veins in the lower leg. And you can see that's a CAP2S because she's symptomatic. Probably C3. She's getting some edema. She's desperate to have something done. And we all say that's going to go, you know, why don't we strip it or something. Until you look at this. Look at the veins. They're going up inside her pelvis. The big thing here is that big lumpy muscle there called the adductor longus is the key. If the veins are behind that tendon, they are pelvic veins, full stop. If they're from the front of that, they can come from an anterior abdominal wall, but usually from the groin. 
And this, we published some results. We did a big survey of all the patients coming to see us, both in NHS and private, because we wanted to make sure we didn't have a selected uh, uh, population. One in seven women with leg varicose veins have, the, have pelvic varicose veins causing them. And if they've had children, it's one in five. So that means that of, those, of women going to vein surgeons at the moment, in this country, one in five, if they've had children, or one in seven, are having the wrong treatment instantly because doctors aren't checking for pelvic veins. And this is not new. We started publishing this 16 years ago, but like leg ulcers, nobody's interested in this sort of thing. If this poor lady, if you look at her back, look at it. She's got perianal veins all the way down. This lady is not going to do well with a high sphenostyle strip or even endovenous surgery. She's got to have the pelvic veins sorted out first. The anatomy you all know. Basically, you've got the ovarian vein coming down, goes around the ovary, and when you've had your babies in particular, it put, bursts through the last few valves, goes down paravolvally and into the legs. The most important thing, it wasn't the baby that caused it. Just the same way that Linda de Cossard showed with le great sphenous vein reflux. The reflux was there first, it was only the passage of the baby that made it apparent on the outside, because you have people with pelvic vein reflux who've never had children. Most importantly, if I don't say it later, the Americans who are following our lead, because very few people in this country listen to me, so I have to lecture a lot in America, because I'm regarded as a nutter still, and that the problem is only 3% of people with pelvic problems have ovarian. 97% are internal iliac. So we like the ovarian, because it's easy, it's big, we can see it, and it's safe to embolize, but it's only the harbinger of what's actually going on, which is the difficult to diagnose one, which is the internal iliac vein. So here we've already said it, 20% of people who've had children get it, women who get it. The only way you can see this, do not send these patients for MRI or MRV or CT because the patient is lying flat. And pain veins don't reflux if you lie flat. So number one, you won't get the diagnosis. Number two, they use the size of the vein, which has been shown to have no correlation at all with whether it refluxes or not. And number three, it's not dynamic. Although you can see some reflux, it doesn't actually show you true reflux. So you cannot see these veins adequately with any imaging technique where you're looking at size and lying the patient flat. We've recently published in Phlebology. For those of you, again, I can give you the reference. It's down here if you want it. But um, I can show you. It's, it's, it's uh, PubMed already. And we've shown that the gold standard is transvaginal duplex ultrasound done by the, white, uh, by the Holdstock uh, method. And she's my vascular technologist who's worked with me now for 16 years, the poor lady. And, she's, um, and it's, you have to scan these people at 45 degrees to see the reflux, and they have to valsalva. If you don't do that, you don't see the reflux. And so it, the gold standard now is transvaginal duplex. There's an American called Nikos Lapropopoulos from New York who is a lovely man. And he's saying you can do this transabdominally, but you can't because you can only see the truncal veins. You can't see where they're going to and where the exit is from the pelvis from the transabdominal. So the only way you can actually see where the, the reflux is going is the transvaginal duplex at the moment. We are working on other methods, but that's the only way. And of course, the treatment of it is um, pelvic vein embolization, which is now a local anesthetic, straight through the jugular vein, straight down into the pelvic veins, and coil embolization with a bit of foam distally. This is a publication that's been published in the American Journal of Vascular Surgery in the venous and uh, lymphatic system, and it's also the guest lecture in the American Venus Forum three years ago. And it shows that if you look at women who've had no hysterectomy and they've had their veins done elsewhere and then they get referred to our clinic for, can you please fix this patient's veins? The commonest was neovascular tissue because they've been stripped before. Once you stop stripping, the commonest cause is missed pelvic veins. That's the commonest cause that women get their veins back again. And that's number one in my list, you treated the wrong veins. So that's the key to it. Incompetent perforating veins, something we don't treat, is the third. Again, missed veins, because most doctors don't look for or treat pelvic veins. So these are really simple things to stop veins coming back again. Just treat the right veins. So this is the study. This is published in the European Journal of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery. And what we did is we looked at competent veins, and we looked at incompetent veins, proven on refluxing on duplex. And what we did is we measured their diameter to an accuracy of 0.1 millimeter using D, uh, DSV. And that was proven against the catheter. And what we showed is there is no correlation with size and reflux. And if you, uh, those of you, if any of you are radiologists, there's a paper by Henshaw, and she said that if the vein, if the ovarian vein is eight millimeters or more, it's a pathological. If it's eight millimeters or less, oh, 10.9 or less, it's not pathological. Well, you draw across the eight, she's 50-50 right. 
So if you go on MRI or CT or venogram or anything on size, half the veins you treat didn't need treatment and half the veins you should have treated have been left untreated. So this is really big news now because these veins, of course, cause vulval varicose veins, vaginal varicose veins, pelvic congestion syndrome, leg problems, hemorrhoids. These are really big, you know, this isn't like a rarity. These are really big numbers that need this treatment. So all of a sudden, you can see if your scan, if it's your varicose veins, if somebody's scanning your legs and it's less than about 35 to 40 minutes, you haven't had a full scan. Because the only way you can see all of those veins and check them all is if you've done a full scan. It's not good enough to scan at the top and say, oh, there's no reflux. Because reflux starts at the bottom and works its way up. Proven in 2001 by us. And so the, the key to this is you've got to do a full scan if you're ever going to get to the problem of it. So what do we know? Now we've got to say, OK, now we know we've got to scan really well. Um, but the other thing is, uh, some, somebody told me the other day that my, my clinic scans every lady's pelvis, and that's not right. We never scan ladies' pelvises unless, number one, they come to us and when we scan the legs, there's reflux coming from above. And we say to them, there is a problem higher up, would you consent to a scan? So that nobody gets a scan as they need one. Or number two, they come with a pelvic problem. They say, I think I've got pelvic congestion syndrome. So it is not routine to have a pelvic scan in our clinic, but if it's needed, it's there on offer. <coughs> So when we come to treatments, number one, I'm sure I don't have to tell you now, but one of the big things that's been important in the past is support stockings. They are not a treatment. Absolutely proven now, without a shadow of doubt. And this idea that some PCTs used to say and some, and some insurance companies used to say, has it been cured in six months and then let us know before you refer, that's utter rubbish. It'll feel better for about six months, but as soon as you take them off, it can't cure it. So all they've done is delayed treatment. And if you're an insurance company, you've got six months more subscription to pay towards the treatment you actually need. So this has now been shown by NICE not to be appropriate. So the support stockings are only there while people are waiting to have proper treatment or if they don't want treatment or can't have it. You've got to know if there's underlying reflux, like if you've got a thread vein, have you got an underlying reflux in the vein causing it? And um, if you're having thread veins, for instance, you will find this underlying reflux in 89% of patients. And so therefore they have to have that treated before the thread veins or else they're not going to get good results. <laughs> Treatments of varicose veins, stripping used to be the old thing, cut in here, stripped down. And as we know, those of us who have done surgical jobs, you write a 14-day um, time off work. So you have 14 days off work because of the, uh, the, the pain. And if it's bilateral, you need 21 days off work. And that was why I started doing venous closure. It's, I only started doing it because you could go back to work the next day. What's really interesting, of course, it was five years before I realised that the veins weren't coming back again. And the key now is not the cosmesis and lack of pain. That's nice. That's not the reason you do it. The reason you do it is the veins just don't come back after you treat them properly. And why not? Well, if you damage a vein, say we forget about varicose veins, we just think about normal surgery. So we're now just treating a vein, we're doing a, lapros uh, a cholecystectomy or opening a laparotomy, and you cut across a vein. What happens in normal life? Firstly, if you do not bleed to death, you end up bleeding and getting a hematoma. Obviously, if you bleed to death, you don't have to worry about this. But if you, if you survive and you put some pressure on it, you get a hematoma. The hematoma then stimulates endothelial budding, which is what we learned at medical school, although the latest research has shown that there's actually um, pro, um, the stem cells in the blood themselves, which gets converted, and white cells also express CD31. So they recruit all these cells that come in and make endothelial cells. You get this budding. And as they meet, the solid cores of cells then start making little channels between them, and you end up with a vein, and you end up reconstituting the vein. And if that didn't happen, we wouldn't heal. So this is not an organ you've removed, like a, a uterus or a gallbladder. This is connective tissue, and connective tissue heals. And the most important thing is when it heals, it has no valves, because you only get valves if it's embryological. So because of that, by definition, some people, when I wrote this on the internet, said, oh, I want my veins to grow back because I have function. Well, if it's a varicose vein, you're going to just get refluxing vein growth straight back. So you, not only have you had 14 days and nights off work, a scar, all the risk of surgery, but you've got the same veins back. And this is now proven. So this is what we published in the British Journal of Surgery, one research prize in 2005, 2007, it was published. This was a great subpoena's vein. It was stripped, it was gone. One year later, we have four veins through what used to be the scar tissue. And on duplex, we can see the flow, so we can see it was refluxing. Um, this is a duplex ultrasound scan, actually showing the reflux. You can actually see this near tissue. That was meant to be one vein, but this is a coiled 
regrowth tissue through the scar tissue in the great sphenous fascia. Um, sorry, this is, uh, oh, here we go. Just got out of step now. So that's, that's basically the <coughs> neovascularization. So we moved on to new techniques in 1999. The aim of the new technique is you, number one, don't miss the veins. You must get the pelvic veins, perforators, great sphenous veins, all the other pieces. It's local anesthetic, you walk in, you walk out, you go back to work the next day. It's not, we have to call it keyhole because everyone's keen on keyhole. It's not, it's pinhole. It's less than two millimeters. We haven't used the stitch for about 10 years or 15 years. You should be back to work the next day unless there's some reason why not. And you do not cause thrombosis. If you cause thrombosis, you're going to get regrowth. It's fibrosis by apoptosis. You put the local anesthetic in using ultrasound, and it's absolutely beautiful. There's a laser inside the vein. You actually have this eye of Horus. It's called the Egyptian eye. And we can put the anesthetic exactly around the vein now with millimeter perfect uh, um, accuracy. When you use foam sclerotherapy, we used to use this technique where we used to use air and um, sclerosin. You make foam out of it. That's now out of date. Most people still use it because it's cheap, but you can get strokes for it. So you must use carbon dioxide and nitrogen and use specialist gases that cannot cause strokes. So nowadays it's all carbon dioxide and nitrogen for foam sclerotherapy. What's beautiful about foam is it goes into the veins, it pushes the blood out, it causes this, this reaction of apoptosis in the vein wall provided you bind the leg, but you must have compression for 14 days and nights. If you don't, the veins reopen, you get thrombus. And the one thing we can't get away from is compression after sclerotherapy. Every patient wants it, but we can't. And that is, you can see foam is quite beautiful. And this is the sort of thing you see, there's a half millimeter vein up there. And in our clinic, we have these epic sevens. You can get into thread veins now using ultrasound guidance. And there's absolutely no reason at all you should be hitting little dermal veins now, because it's really uh, th that good. The trouble with foam sclerotherapy is if it, the vein's less than three millimetres, 100% occlusion works really well. Four to five is 80% occlusion at three years. If it's greater than six millimetres, 0% occlusion. So all these people that you'll hear about in the Midlands, there's a professor, there's lots of people in London who put the foam in, do it all by foam. That's because they'll see the patients again in two or three years' time and redo it and then redo it and redo it because it doesn't work. And I'll come to why it doesn't work in a minute if, we, if you can bear me to keep talking. Has the wine come? No, yet, so I can keep talking. <laughs> I promise I'll stop when the wine comes. The, so basically, there's this thing called radio, this, the very first uh, catheter that came to the country was a radio frequency catheter that passed current between the electrodes, and that's what burned the vein wall. I used to go around lecturing, explaining this too. You actually got induction heating. The, the thing itself doesn't get hot. It's the passage of the electricity through the vein of wall that induces the heat. So you can't burn anybody with it unless you do it really badly. And it's a beautiful technique, and now it's very old, but it was, it's the first one in the England, it's the first end of venous surgery, and it worked beautifully. We used to just put in the whole varicose vein operation through that one incision, just a one cannula. It's absolutely beautiful, loved it. Then, unfortunately, Venus produced this new thing called Venus Closure Fast, called Benefit. We stopped using it in 2005. I know a lot of doctors are still using it. It is hopeless, though, in my, in my opinion, and I shouldn't say it, I'm sure. The trouble is, it's what I call the Tonka toy. If you're just doing your first 100 veins, it's easy. You put it in, you push the button once or twice, and that's it. But it's seven centimeters long. You can't get up small veins, you can't get into perforators, you can't do delicate work, you can't do more energy, you can't use less energy, you can't do an eight centimeter junction. So this is the beginner's varicose vein thing. If you want to do your first hundred veins and you want to say you're doing endovenous surgery, you use this. As soon as you know anything about perforators, probably is anything, you drop this like a hot cookie and you go onto the end of this laser or one of the other techniques. These are the new lasers nowadays. It's not just fiber. You have to have these lovely cores around the outside which stop making holes in the wall. You also have the ones that shine out to the side, radial, because of course it's the wall that you're trying to treat, not the lumen. And in my clinic, we'd research everything. So even before I had the university contract, I used to go to Tesco's, I should have gone to Waitrose of course, but I went to Tesco's, it's cheaper, and I used to get bits of liver and I used to stick lasers in them and put glass in them, put the goggles on, and I used to see what the different techniques caused, what damage it caused. And that's how we got to understand why some of the companies were actually giving the wrong information to doctors because, and we'd say to them, why are you giving this wrong information? They're like, well, it's a bit safer, they won't burn anybody. And so people are getting inadequate treatments if they follow company advice. So we spend a lot of time checking company advice and reissuing guidelines and saying, actually, we use a slightly different power because of, and we've got proof why. And we've moved on now. Not only do we do these lovely um, sort of um, uh, techniques with ultrasound where you can measure absolutely everything with ultrasound that comes through, but we're now starting to do all sorts of immunosub chemistry, which I'll show you shortly. 
There are new treatments of sleep, or mock or clarivane, which is a wire that whizzes around on the inside and causes damage to the vein as you pull it down and put sclerotherapy in. It's a really good technique, but it's not perfected yet. There's super glue, venous seal, which works if, as long as it's a 10 millimeter vein or less. But at the moment, uh, steam vein sclerosis, they're all new. At the moment, then if, you, if it's your veins, get something done that you know works. These new things have got some indications at the moment, but they're coming way forward. We've talked about perforators, so I won't bore you with that. Do remember, this is a lecture I gave to the Vascular Surgical Society, recurrent primary varicose veins, leg ulcer, and um, varicose, recurrent varicose veins all caused only by perforators, and yet people will still tell you that perforators don't cause a problem. That all of those were cured by just treating the perforator and nothing else. Um, I'm just going to rush on a little bit, uh, but because uh, the, we were talking about pelvic congestion syndrome. The thing with pelvic congestion syndrome, as we said before, it's not just the varicosities. What happens when you have venous reflux? It's not just, in my book I wrote it saying it's the banging down the blood. It's not. It's also the fact you don't clear it. And venous blood is acidic because it's got carbon dioxide in it and that gives you carbonic acid. And the longer it sits in a vein, the more acidic it becomes, the more inflammation it causes. So the reason get people get leg ulcers around the ankles and the reason that women get pain in the pelvis is because they have stasis in the blood. And that's the real problem. It's not just the reflex, so it's, both. it's two things. It's the reflux and the bang, but it's also the stasis. And that's why if you can take away the volume of the vein, you get an improvement. And hence, that's why pelvic venous congestion is becoming an area where the gynecologists and phlebologists really have to discuss how we're going to treat these patients best. Um, I've just popped through this. This is a transvaginal duplex where we can actually see a lovely refluxing vein down here on transvaginal duplex into varicosities. It's a very, very easy little thing to see. Um, and this is a, when it's had the coils in it, you get rid of all of that reflux. So the coil embolization stops that dead. So our own research, we do, as I said, we started off doing research in bits of liver from Tesco's, showing that the, the, what the company said was inadequate, and it, sometimes it burned patients. And so we ended up showing that this is what the company recommended. We showed that if you change the company's settings, you actually got safer and you got better treatments. This basically is the threshold for whether you killed the vein or not. We've fed back, it's Olympus, this company. We've fed back, we've published it, but they won't change because they've got American approval for their instructions for use. So they send doctors along to me to be told how I do it because they can't recommend the right way to do it, which is awful. So if you buy one and don't get trained, you end up using the wrong technique because that's what the company recommends. But it's a crazy situation when that happens. We, we back everything up with history. Uh, histology. If you're anything like me, unless you're a histopathologist, I call these pink blobograms because I cannot see anything in them very much. But we get reports on histopathology. I want to see something a bit clearer. So we started doing different stains to get different colours because that makes it easier to me. But in fact, this is my thing that I love now. This is immunocytochemistry. And we're doing this through the university. And this is the lumen. The red is, is CD31. That means it's got endothelial markers. It's got living endothelial cells on. And the green palisades are alpha trypsin. And what that means is the antibody is sticking to living smooth muscle. So that's a living vein wall. You put foam sclerotherapy in and it dies. Brilliant. That's how it works. But look, it only endothelium, 50 microns, 100 microns, 150 microns, 200 microns. It only works if the vein wall is 250 microns or less. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Your great venous vein is 400 to 600 microns. Foam sclerotherapy does not treat great venous veins or small venous veins. And you will have lots of people out there who will say, oh, I'll treat it with foam, and if it comes back, I'll do it again. Just do it with laser, because you get the whole 600 microns in one go. So this is what the Whitey Protocol is all about, is taking the patient, taking the vein, using the research to choose the right combination, and you tailor the approach. Nobody gets the standard operation. Standard operations cause recurrence. So, as I say, the nice guidelines now agree with virtually everything we've been saying for ages. That's just the glue, which is a terribly nice technique to use it. I'm not going to go through. These are just the training and the bits and pieces we do for people around. Because I think not many people in London know how big our unit is in Guildford and how, what the international reputation we have for research and people come from all over the world to do it. One thing we discovered in 2001 is everybody, when we were in medical school, got told that when you're fat, pregnant, when you coughed a lot, the top valve went, then the next valve went, the next valve went, and it was a domino theory of valves going down the leg. That's what we've always thought, and hence the high tie works. It's complete rubbish. In fact, what happens is, if you follow patients up, the first reflux is around your knee or around the leg, and then ascends, and the last valve to go is in your groin. 
And that's why high ties didn't work. And that's why the stripping was a good idea if only it didn't come back. And that's why intravenous laser works. It doesn't matter if you tie the top or not. That's not where the problem is. It's the actual trunk itself. So, to conclusion, is the wine here? No. Can you chase it? Because I'm coming to the conclusion. Thank you. <laughs> so, why do veins come back? Number one, I hope I've convinced you the wrong vein being treated is the commonest cause. The second thing is, there's the right vein, but the wrong technique. You stuff foam up, uh, a great saphenous vein. You put a laser up, but you've used the wrong power, and you've used uh, something that doesn't burn deeply enough. You use foam sclerotherapy in a, a vein that is too big for foam sclerotherapy. So it's just not understanding the science of the vein wall. The third thing, de novo reflux. So if you don't want your veins to go back, firstly, go to the right place that has a team approach. Never, ever send a patient to, patient, or don't be a doctor, that does your own scans in veins because you're breaking nice guidelines and you can't get the same standards. Scan all the veins, including perforated, and you have to be able to do transvaginal duplex or get someone to do it who knows the whole stop protocol because if you don't, you're not going to get that reflux. Secondly, use research proven techniques and use the size of the vein, not the diameter on ultrasound, that doesn't matter. Because if you've got a 10 centimeter vein and you make that person cold, they've got a 3 centimeter, uh, sorry, millimeter vein. You've got a 10 millimeter vein and you make them cold, they've got a 3 millimeter vein. That's not a 3 millimeter vein, it's a contracted 10 millimeter vein. So you don't care what size the ultrasound for tells you it is, it's the thickness of the wall that matters. And as I said before, never trust anyone who says their recurrence rate is less than 3% because they don't exist. You will have de novo recurrence in 3 to 4.5% of people. So our conclusions, it's not aesthetic. Always think of hidden varicose veins. Never tell a patient they've got a problem, they haven't got a problem. You can tell them they've got a problem because you can see it. You can't tell they haven't unless they've got a duplex ultrasound scan. And what the Whiteley protocol is, and I know that some people have been a bit scratchy about me calling it the Whiteley protocol, but it's very simple. And what it is, is a proper duplex ultrasound scan that goes in order through every single vein that is refluxing, and it's treating them, phase one, with the technique that stops the reflux. Phase two, with the foam sclerotherapy that stops the endothelial budding for recurrence in the future. Phase three, any cosmetic with microsclerotherapy. It's a very logical way to go through. And nobody can really argue with that in the vein world. They might not like the name of it, but that's the only logical way you can treat. And if you're treating the microsclerotherapy before you treat the reflux, you'll have problems. And if you treat the foam before you do the trunk of reflux, you'll have problems. If you've got a leg ulcer, you might only want phase one. You might not care about recurrence, and you might not care about cosmesis. So you don't have to have all three. You tailor the approach to what the patient is in front of you. I hope that's been slightly interesting. Veins are far, far, far more fascinating than I ever thought when I was a registrar. And I'm now 53, and I'm absolutely enjoying work more than ever because there's, there's so much more we're learning at the moment. Do you have any questions at all? A couple of questions. First thing, I might have got it wrong or misheard it. You said you approach the treatment to the jugular vein. Yeah. Do you go from jugular all the way down to pelvis? Yeah. What's the logic of that? Because I would have thought that the shorter the distance you have to travel, the less the internal trauma for you. Yeah. It's this anatomy because your ovarian veins are pointing upwards yeah. and your internal IA veins are pointing upwards. And as my interventional radiologist told me when he was going with this idea with me, if you're landing a plane, you land it straight down because it's easy. You don't come in the wrong way and suddenly try and twist at the last minute. So if you go through the groin and you have to go up and you have to go back down the, uh, the, the, common, uh, the, um, the ovarian, if you're doing a simple truncle, you can do it. But if you're going in the internal eyelid, so you're trying to find the obturator vein right down into the thing, so we're now doing really, really selective venogram, you have to go all the way up and back down again. You've got so many bends in the catheter, it's not very accurate. Because in here, it's a dead straight line. So if you go for the heart, or you go for the brain, you go in the groin. If you're going downwards, go for the jugular. You can go from the arm, if the patient asks, but it's more like the thrombose, because it's a small vein. Internal jugular is very simple, very easy, local anesthetic, straight down. The second question is, just because these women have a veins, that, we, that you and I have found they have veins, doesn't always mean that that is the cause of the pain. Is there anything you can do before embarking on? <laughs> Inevitably, what you're doing is, is rather expensive. Is there anything you can do yeah. to say, yes, it is causing the pain, and this is likely to help? Absolutely. This is the conversation we're having before, and this is really, really important. So, in my world, I came from Lake Varicose veins that were not being treated properly because of pelvic reflux. 
So we then added public reflux to stop incompetence. So we've worked our way into the pelvis for those reasons. Now, of course, we're getting pelvic congestion syndrome going through, and I'm first to accept I am not a gynecologist, and that's why I want to work with gynecologists, because if a woman comes to me and says, I've got all these different pains, I'm not, I haven't got years of experience in those uh, things. If a gynecologist says to me, I really don't know what's going on with this woman, can you just check? Can we, uh, there's nothing great on MRI or laparoscopy or whatever, but then you do a TB scan, they've got crashing reflux. The chances are, if it fits, with what the gynecologist is suspicious is, that could probably do with treatment. If a woman comes to me because of the internet and just says, I want it, and I say, have you seen a gynecologist first? We'll do a TV scan on her, then we will send her to a gynecologist and say, we've found reflux, but can you check that you think that this is a, a good cause? So we're not going off and doing things. We, in my clinic, everything has got to be research-based. And everything I do on the leg side is basic, is purely scientific. When it comes to symptomatology in the pelvis, I'm the first to turn around and say we can look at the morphology, but we need the experts to tell us whether that's actually likely to be related. And we only then can send patients if we've got that nod of approval. Thank you. What happens in male patients? Sorry? What happens in male patients? Oh, I wish I hadn't asked that. That's so difficult because about one in every 30 male um, men do have pelvic vein reflux. And you've got impotence as well, there's all the things, and you can go in. You, we have to do an MRI, and we have to do venograms, and we have to guess. We are looking at different things like transperineal, um, uh, uh, transrectal doesn't work very well, and it is so difficult. So women who can't have a TV scan, and men, at the moment are our bugbear. And that's why I'm excited, because if I had all the answers, I wouldn't be so excited, because that's where the research is going at the moment. Um, sorry, yes. this gentleman, sorry. What is the cost of a duplex scan? The duplex scan for a full leg duplex scan is about, I think it's 370, I think, 370. So it's by the hour as you work out, it's actually quite inexpensive. And the transvaginal scan is, I think, 273, I think. Um, for an elderly person who couldn't be operated on with a history of varicose ulcer. What, in your opinion, what would be the best treatment for local uh, nursing uh, uh, changing or dressing doesn't uh, work? So do you maybe know, so laser, uh, yeah. would you think laser I, I, treatment would yeah, be helpful? Yeah, I have, I have got, we've published a paper in 2012 it is, it's got an 85% cure rate on patients who all of them have been sent to me because they were incurable, they, had, they were non-surgical. The easy ones have been treated. These are people at the wit's end, they've been told they're incurable. But when you do a proper scan and you do the proper endovenous or trollop or all the different bits and pieces, 85% had complete cure. 52% didn't even need a stocking afterwards. 33% need the stocking, and of the 15% who were incurable, those were the ones we, we improved the majority of them, the pain reduced, but we couldn't get on top of it. Those are the only ones that I would accept. However, the latest research, for those of you who are really into veins as well, we find that the incurable venous ulcers are the few that have actually got stenoses in the eye veins, and it's an obstructive outflow. And you can't see it sometimes on MRI and CT unless it's a big occlusion. They've got webs. So we now use, I don't want to go into all of this, but we've actually got intravascular ultrasound. You've got these tubes that go up inside and do an intravascular ultrasound, and you find these calcified vein webs that you can't see on any other imaging. You put a stent across that, the ulcers heal. It's absolutely, honestly, veins are so fascinating at the moment because there's so many things we thought we knew about. And you can almost always, now the only thing that I'd say about it is for a venous ulcer, if the patient isn't walking and isn't mobile, then you've got to think, should I even start? Because if they can't, yeah, as long as they can walk, then you should investigate them fully because they'll pump. If you fix the veins but they're never going to walk again, then you can't get the pump, you see. So you've got to have two bits. You've got the veins working and the pumping together. All right. Sorry. If you have an annual recurrence rate of about 1 in 25, which is what we're saying there with your... Uh, that's a thing over, yeah. Yeah, so that's inescapable. Is there some argument for delaying procedure? Because if you push it out 10 years, you've avoided a whole load of... What would have been the number of recurrences because you're going to pick it up with one operation? That's as long as you accept the pulmonary embolisms, the thrombophrobitis, the bleeding, the complications, and the fact that you've got a much more complicated operation at the end and a bad quality of life. So the answer is... But you, you, but you might not have. Yes. 40% of people don't have a bad quality of life. No, so, no, 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 that's not true. So the, the reactive study didn't actually accept that. The reactive study actually shows that when you look at the whole group, the whole group as a whole had a worse quality of life if they didn't have the treatment. And that's over the, the top. So the point with it is, is you don't know which one of those are going to go on and get the, the complications. Now, with the thing with varicose veins is up until nine years ago when the active study was done, everybody said they're only cosmetic, leave them. 
And that's why the reactive study was done. And everybody wanted, it was only just funded because they wanted to do exactly that, to leave it. But what they showed is that within two years, you already had the advantage to the surgery. And the people who didn't were getting complications. <laughs> so that's already been answered. So we're really saying everyone from C2 up, actually, in your view, would need surgery. Not in my view. In, in the, the published nice. research randomized control studies, yeah. as where they have an advantage to surgery. And if they don't, you'll leave them more like that. And do remember superficial thrombophlebitis, which people used to give antibiotics for. We now know it should be aspirins and stockings. Since 2012, if they, everybody with thrombophlebitis should have a scan. Because if it's within five centimeters of a junction, you have a 1% chance of pulmonary embolism. Not from a DVT, from a superficial thrombophlebitis. How many people get sent for scans with thrombophlebitis? Absolutely nobody. But the medical wards are full of people who have got deep pulmonary embolism and thought, oh, we don't know why. But it's actually there. The American College of uh, Hematology and the English, um, I think it's blood, but the two national bodies of America and UK have said everyone with superficial venous thrombophlebitis should have a scan and should be anticoagulated if it's within five centimeters of junction for that reason. The whole thing about veins is, you know, people say, oh, it's big varicose veins, it's not protective, don't worry about it. And then they get thrombophlebitis, and it's, oh, it's only thrombophlebitis. But well, 1% are getting a PA. So veins have been, unfortunately, for too long, it's been just veins. And people don't realize the pathology that's caused by just veins. When you do look at it scientifically, as has been done now many times, reactive study, s the other things, we've found that we've missed a trick. And this should be funded. And I said, I should be a pro practitioner talking this. When I was in Oxford, I used to give this talk as a as a as an NHS person because it's the veins that need treatment. Sorry. Yes. So oh, I, yes, I just wanted to know what uh, contraindications there are to any of your techniques. Um, for instance, something like a clotting disorder or a bleeding diathesis. Yeah, well, funny enough, we operate on people who are on rivaroxaban or warfarin. We don't even stop it now because it's been whole surgery. So if, they, if they're bleeders, we'd have no problem at all. I've just published a paper on treating Ehlers-Danlos syndrome because people die from having vein surgery with Ehlers-Danlos because the veins rip when you do phlebectomies, and if you try and open them. But if you use endovenous thermal ablation or photosphere therapy, you can actually cure them even if they've got that. If it's a clotting problem, one of the biggest problems we have at the moment, people who are coming with recur recurrent clottings, is obviously the, there's two sorts really. There's people who have just started clotting and they've usually got a cancer or a problem and they need a medical workout and before they see us. And we often refer people on and say to the physicians, please sort these people out first. We talk a lot to the haematologists, but the reality is the majority of people who, who have got lots of clotting problems for the long term come to us because they've got leg ulcers. So we work closely with the haematologists with those because most of them actually need to have stents and need to be recanalized because you can cure them. And most of those, I must say, we don't see privately. We diagnose them privately, but it's going to be too expensive for them. So we work very closely with David Beckett, who um, he works in uh, Bournemouth and Paul, and you should remember his name. He's going to be one of the biggest names in vein surgery in the next uh, decade. He's, he's stenting IVCs, he's stenting all the bits and pieces. Well, I was thinking more of things like protein C and protein yeah. S deficiency. Yeah, but the, the thing is, if they, they've got to have had a history of doing it, actually, they wouldn't know they've got that. So for us as surgeons, it's what have they got to do that? So if, if somebody comes in, they've got protein C, we don't test their screen everybody for it, because being a surgeon is such a low risk. You've got a 1 in 80 chance of a DVT if you have general anaesthetic for venous surgery, but if you have local anaesthetic, walk in, walk out, you're drinking, you don't starve, it's less than, it's about 1 in 5,000 of even the smallest DVT, so it's incredibly low risk unless they come in, and that's why everyone has a consultation first. So if they've had DVTs in the past, all family history, they're all picked up. Yes. Uh, could I just ask you if um, there's any role for this in post-DVT uh, venous problem, and also uh, post-pelvic and leg fracture. Absolutely. Uh, Could you say the role in that? Yeah, one of the most interesting things is that when I was a medical student, I was taught that if you had a DVT, it was game over. You couldn't have anything you done because you would have scarring of your deep veins. That was shown by Vaughan Ruckley about 12 years ago to be incorrect. If you have one DVT that's, that's treated aggressively and quickly, you have no, the majority of people have no scar tissue or no reflux or nothing at all. You, to get scar tissue, to get post thrombotic the syndrome, if you ask the patients closely enough, they've had more than one episode, or they've had an episode that wasn't cured aggressively, which is now why the Europeans are starting to do thrombolysis and they're having mechanical clot removal and stenting. So the whole of the post-thrombotic syndrome has become fascinating. The most important thing is, 
If you have an EBTO spectrum and you treat it quickly, you end up with pristine veins at the end of it with almost no problem at all, and that person can be treated almost as normal, provided, as per NICE guidelines, there was a stimulating reason for it, surgery or something. If you don't have a stimulating reason for it, and you've got one, well, you've got to really worry about cancers, you've got to worry about you know, all the different uh, hematological things, which are now less common than the cancer in the over 40s, so remember that, so you've got to screen them for different reasons. So it's always that way round, so look at it. But no, no, nowadays, a single DVT, or even a couple of DVTs, should not stop a full venous investigation, certainly shouldn't stop any procedures, if it is warranted on the clinical outcome, so you know things like leg ulcers or or CAP three four fives, and, and fractures post post fracture. Oh well, the, 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 just post the fracture. Venous would, problem. Yeah. So if you had a venous problem, then it would be what is that venous problem? So if you had an occluded vein or post fracture because it had DVT or something, yes, you can stent them, you know, and you get back to normal function. So I mean, the, the, the stenting at the moment on the venous side, what's really interesting about stenting of veins is it turns out that the long-term results of five years of a venous stent is actually better than an arterial stent, which we, we got really shocked about when that came out. Mm -hmm. What metals do you use for the coils? The coils are actually, the ones we use are Boston Scientific and it's platinum. And they've been now used for about 40 years, and there's no substantiated problem with any sort of uh, difficult, with any spreading of it or breaking off one bits and pieces. There have been a couple of reports of embolization of the coils as a whole coil, but this idea that you can actually break off bits of it and have immune responses to it doesn't seem to be right. And one of the reasons is post mortem studies of people who have unfortunately died or post uh, or operations shows that within 8 to 14, uh, 8 to 12 weeks of that coil going in, you've only got fibrous tissue around it. It's destroyed the vein so much it's now coated in fibrous tissue. The vein has become fibrous tissue and it's totally excluded from the body. Now, if we worry about that, we should not be doing bowel anastomosis with clips. We shouldn't be putting um, all staples into the arteries. We shouldn't be doing, uh, doing um, clips onto the tubes for sterilization. We shouldn't be using clips down the appendicectomies, down laparoscopic things. We use much more metal in closing a sternum or doing a bowel anastomosis than you do with these incredibly wispy little coils that go down the veins. So, so when you actually look at the volume of metal, it's tiny compared to most things that we've accepted for 20, 30, or 40 years. These coils also, it's not new. Although it's new for us to put them in these veins, you've all known about, you've all known about um, fibroid embolization for, for um, uh, fibroids for ages, haven't you? They've been used for that. They've used, been used for testicular. They've been used to stop bleeding intestinally. I mean, they're well-recognized embolization things since the 70s and 80s is when it first started. So all I've done, I've not done anything that clever because I'm not that bright. What I've done is I've taken something that nobody knew how to treat before, found a way to do it, got the right experts, not me doing it, got them, I put them together, and would use well-recognized technology in a, 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 an area that hadn't been used before and just found out how it works. So nothing in this is like sparklingly new. It's just a new way of thinking about it based upon the science of how we now understand hemodynamics. Have I talked to everybody into submission? <laughs> Please enjoy your wine. <laughs> we'll ask you another question. Do you have another question? Please enjoy some wine at the end. Thank you.